Thank you very much, John. And we have a nothing nothing ball game just underway out here in San Diego, California, Jack Murphy Stadium. It's the Houston Astros going against the San Diego Padres. I'm Steve Fiziak along with Dave Campbell tonight and Eric Yelding, who reached on an error, on a error that was charged to the second baseman, Roberto Alomar, but really he was hustling to get in position to field a bunt. And now we understand that they have changed the error and they have given it to the pitcher. Dennis Rasmussen but when they first came out with the report they called it on Alomar what happened was yielding bunted back to the pitcher who made the play Jack Clark really should have covered first base Alomar came over from second in a hustle play and they say the throw pulled his foot off the bag so now it's one ball two strikes the count to Billy Dorn and yielding is going he has 19 stolen bases this year make it 20 balls into center field and Eric yielding easily into third base well, San Diego does not start the game very well defensively. A matter right there of Yelding stealing the base on Dennis Rasmussen. He had a big jump. Benito Santiago, who is a terrific throwing catcher, and you see him throwing from the knees. Benito's won the Golden Glove twice in this league, but he's also led the league in errors the last three years, and this is his eighth error so far early in 1990. So Santiago is either real great or sometimes air mills that ball in the center field, and the Astros have a man at third with nobody out here in the first. Count two balls and two strikes to Billy Doran. Really looked like Alomar needed to get down. The ball was skipping towards him and went through his legs. Yielding at third base, tremendous speed. The ball's in the dirt. Santiago with a nice job of blocking it. Nice play by Benito, and that's uh, one thing a defensive player has to do. You shake off the 0 for fours, and you also have to shake off the airs. I agree with you. That ball uh, should have been knocked down by Robbie Alomar at second base, and that's something that Davy Johnson. When he was managing the Mets, did a lot of talking with to Greg Jeffries at second base for the New York Mets. They said too many low throws were skipping past Jeffries as he was trying to make the swipe tag when they really didn't have a shot at the runner. And in that case, they had no shot at Yelding. Alomar should have knocked that ball down. They play the infield in on the right side, deep with the left, and they throw a ball forward to Bill Doran. So two on and nobody out in San Diego starting very poorly Dennis Rasmussen is making his 11th start of the year seventh at home and first against the Astros he's won his last two and four of his last five so he has been on a hot streak and most importantly last year he was just disastrous in the first inning he's improved that figure this year Dave yeah 14 out of the first 17 games he pitched a year ago teams scored runs in the first inning then he went three for his last 16 and only two for 10 this year that's only five times out of the last 26 tries he started really spotting down in the bullpen prior to the game. He started really trying to pick up the catcher's glove and working the spots. Rick Vigio, the batter, now swings and misses in the count. No balls and one strike. To the catcher for the Houston Astros. And Houston with runners in the corners. Nobody out. First inning of play. Well, this is a key man for Rasmussen right now because the man behind Glenn Davis has been the hottest hitter in baseball the last nine days with nine home runs and 19 runs batted in perfect situation for Houston and they like to run Doran has very good speed with six stolen bases over first base He's not going and the pitch is missing one ball one strike Rasmussen can really lull you to sleep with a very slow move to first base but he'll throw over there three or four times often with a kind of a mediocre move and the runner thinks he has him read and then Dennis will give him a little better move and pick you off so Doran's going to have to be careful of that. But we have the two National League leaders as far as tosses to first base showing tonight in Jim Deshays and Dennis Rasmussen. He's coming home here, and Vigio is fooled, and it's one and two. Now Rasmussen trying to get the ground ball here. He'll trade the double play for an early run, but to really blunt this inning. Yeah, you mentioned uh, we've gotten so deep into statistics now that they keep track of throws to first base. Last year, Jim Deshays, 355 tosses <laughs> to first, easily the leader in Major League Baseball. Doran looks like he wants to go. He has a good read on Rasmussen, but stays put, and there's a snap toss to first base. Yeah, you mentioned Jack Clark, and we get a shot of him right there. This is Jack's first game back since May the 5th when he hurt his back, and he's got double zero in his back. He changed that day in Chicago to double zero. He ended up hurting his back. The next time he appeared on the field was in New York during batting practice on May 25th. He got hit in the face with a throw from the outfield that fractured a cheekbone. I thought maybe he'd switch back to 25, but he still got double zero. 
according to the stars in the planets the way they have them aligned double zero is supposed to be a positive statement not so for jack clark thus far going to work for robert parish this year <laughs> <laughs> it had for several seasons though jeffrey leonard wears it for the seattle mariners Darn's going and the pitch is swung on missed by Craig Biggio. He strikes out. Well, Glenn Davis will not get a chance to hit. That just took the bat right out of Davis's hands because he'll get four wide ones because he has been the hottest hitter in baseball. Batting fourth. First baseman number 27. That may have been a ball out of the strike zone. Yeah, it was a one-hop curveball. It's just that Biggio couldn't lay off it. So Dennis fed him nothing but off-speed pitches, and now they're going to walk Glenn Davis. Glenn's trying to get a toll in the batter's box, but Glenn, when they're going to walk you, you might as well just get in there and take the four. There's no reason to let him swing. Six home runs in his last four games, and the only problem with that, they've lost all four of those games. He had three home runs Friday in a game we did on ESPN, and they lost to the San Francisco Giants. He had all five RBIs. They lose at 6 5 and 11 innings. Now you go back to a week ago Saturday, a doubleheader that the Astros swept at Wrigley Field. Davis broke out of a two for 23 at that time with three home runs and nine RBIs in the doubleheader. He was relatively quiet in the three game series against St. Louis at home in the dome. But then he goes into San Francisco and he hits five home runs and knocks in nine runs in three days. Homered last night. So that's nine home runs and 19 RBIs in just six games. But the Astros went two and four. And there are those figures that we were talking about earlier on Dennis Rasmus, and he has improved that dramatically this year. Nine home runs in the first inning last year. Only one thus far in 1990, and he's given up seven total. Ken Caminiti takes strike one. Well, again, the thing that they really started to work with Rasmussen on, they were trying everything last year, but finally they said, Dennis, you're just going down and getting loose in the bullpen. You're not really concentrating on throwing to a target. So about the last seven minutes of his warm up they really had the catcher move the glove around and had him try to hit it and he's had better luck since then. One ball one strike and visiting with pitching coach Pat Dobson earlier tonight he said hey, he's not nibbling as much that used to bother the heck out of me. My attitude is let's throw that ball low. But get the ground ball outs. Don't be worried if they tag it pretty well. Let's make sure they hit it, but hit it on the ground. And Rasmussen has not been nibbling this year. He's been challenging him. Here's the 1 1 pitch, and Caminetti takes strike two. <laughs> Inning did not start well for Rasmussen. Yelding reached on an error, stole second base, went to third in the throwing error by Santiago. Bill Doran walked. Biggio then struck out. Glenn Davis was intentionally passed. And now Santiago and Rasmussen and Gary Templeton comes in from the short to have a discussion. Well, the infielders want to know. I don't know if uh, Santiago got crossed up, but a lot of times the infielders, as we look at the grand slam totals from a year ago and this year, the infielders want to know what's coming just as well as the catcher does. I think maybe Benito got crossed up and Templeton went in to say, hey, which, uh, which signal is it? First, second, third? We want to know too. One ball, two strikes. Just does miss. Two balls and two strikes. Caminetti, a switch hitter. He hits a lot better from the right side where he's batting right now. Career wise, he's about 60 points better batting right handed. And the curveball breaking down. And a tough pitch for Caminetti to lay off, but definitely a ball. Base is loaded. Only one out. Top of the first inning. And Ken Caminetti hits one hard in the alley, but over as Tony Gwynn makes the catch. Tagging is Eric Yelding. The throw goes into second base, and it's 1 0 Houston. Well, Caminetti delivers on a fastball from Rasmussen. Dennis got it up, and Tony Gwynn makes the smart throw into the cutoff man. He had no shot at the speed of Yelding, and he held the other two runners in place. Well, he has an outstanding arm in right field. He made a play last night and almost took a double away from one of the Houston Astros when it should have been double easily all the way, but. Gwynn with that dart of an arm cut him down and the Houston Astros went down to lose 10 to 2 last night to the San Diego Padres their fourth straight loss fastball low runners now at first and second two outs and Rasmussen trying to work out of a very difficult jam with only one run being allowed Glenn Wilson has been slumping his average right now at 227 with three home runs and 14 RBIs 
And that has been the big thorn in the side of the Astros this year. There's a swing and a miss on the outside pitch by Wilson. He likes the ball away, but the hitters five and six need to protect Glenn Davis, and they haven't done anything. Well, for the Padres, their task is to keep the ball in the ballpark. They've allowed 59 home runs this year. That's the major league lead, and that's something you don't want to lead in. The Padres have not gone two consecutive games this year without allowing a home run. They almost went a uh, game last night. But Glenn Davis in the ninth inning hit number 16. And you know you compare how Cincinnati is doing. They're in first place in the National League West by nine games and hitting they're virtually even. But it's been the pitching staff of Cincinnati which has been so dominant. Well the Reds started the night with a 2.92 ERA the Padres 3.96 that's a full run more and that really reflects in the standings. Wilson with a swing and a miss and Rasmussen able to squeak out of the jam by allowing just one run. We head to the bottom of the first inning with the Astros up by one. This starting lineup is presented by Sears Die Hard. To lead things off with the San Diego Padres. They'll go with Biff Roberts at third base. Hitting second is Roberto Alomar, then Tony Gwynn. Batting fourth, Joe Carter. And Jack Clark, his first game in over a month, will be starting and hitting in the number five spot. Then it's Benito Santiago, Sean Abner, Gary Templeton, and Dennis Rasmussen on the mound. Looking at the defense for the Houston Astros, Ken Caminetti is at third base, excellent fielder. Rafael Ramirez, he is not an excellent fielder. He played short. Billy Dorn at second and Glenn Davis at first. Glenn Wilson is in left looking for career assist number 100. He has 99 in his career. Eric Yelding, a man of many positions, is in center. Eric Anthony, the power hitter in right. Craig Biggio is the catcher and left hander Jim Deshays on the mound for Houston tonight looking for his fourth win. Big guy six feet four inches tall 220 pounds like Rasmus and he's won his last two starts. He beat San Francisco last Thursday five to three and in 1990 well he's three and two and there's a look at his innings pitch to hits ratio not bad. He would like to see a little bit better control he says with 26 walks thus far but Jim Deshays may be their number one stopper the way Mike Scott has been pitching Dave. Well he does hold a major league record and that was back in 1986 when he struck out eight consecutive Dodgers starting off a ball game. Nobody has ever done that to start off a game. He doesn't have the same kind of stuff he did then he had shoulder surgery in 1987. He's a little more of a finesser now. Well, here's the first offering to Vip Roberts and it is strike one. Roberts this year is hitting very well at 313, four home runs, 15 RBIs, and last night Bip went three for five. He has a 12 game hit streak going. Again, that high fastball staying up there, and there are scouts who say, I have no idea how he has the kind of success he does throwing that high fastball that does not get up in the 90s. Roberts. The drive to center field, yelling with plenty of speed, gets there, one out. Now let's check out what's happening in the National League with John Saunders and ESPN. Quickly around the league, the Expos and Mets tied at five in the tenth. McReynolds with a two-run home run tied that game up. Milt Thompson with a bases loaded triple as St. Louis leads the Phillies five to three right now. Gary Reedus with a ground out knocked in the game-winning run as Pittsburgh beat Chicago six to five. The Braves and the Dodgers scoreless, as are Cincinnati and San Francisco. We'll check the American League in a moment. And Cincinnati started tonight with a nine-game lead on second place Santi San Diego. We've got Jim Deshays right now going against San Diego's Roberto Alomar one of the finest second basemen in all of Major League Baseball and he's only 22 years old. Here's the 0 1 pitch to him inside one ball one strike that is one thing that Deshays is not afraid of coming inside you look at how many people he's hit this year and you don't maybe want to talk about that those are Alomar's numbers this year 330 average he's in the top 10 but he has hit four guys this year and Dennis Rasmussen has not hit any and he has been criticized in his past of not pitching inside. Well I think left handers who come inside and really saw the bats off are some of the more effective pitchers in baseball right now. And he strikes out Roberto Alomar right here and there's two down. Let's check out the American League scores now with John. Tigers over Cleveland. Allen Trammell two for three, knocking in two runs. Tony Fernandez three for five with three runs batted in. The Jays beat Minnesota. Chicago, a loser to Seattle. Jay Buhner with a three-run double in that game. California and Kansas City. Chili Davis with a two-run home run. B.J. Surhoff is a home run for Milwaukee. And Mark McGuire has two. Back to Stephen Day. 
And we have Tony Gwynn coming to the plate. Houston leading one nothing as we're in the bottom of the first inning of play with two outs. And Jim Deshays to Tony Gwynn stays low. You were talking about left-handers pitching inside. Why is it that they'll knock the bats out of your hand? Well, because most of the time left-handers fastballs tail away, so the right-handed batters go out and try to drive that ball to right center field, and all of a sudden the sharp slider comes in on the hands or a good cut fastball, and it just eats them alive. Deshays has had a great deal of success. I remember Dave Drebecki didn't throw that hard, but he broke more bats than anybody in National League one year. Another statistic that was kept. <laughs> How many broken bats by a left-handed starter? I remember Larry Boa when he was playing with the Chicago Cubs. Uh, one time came in here and he broke four at bats in one at bat against Drebecki when he was pitching with the Padres. Boy, Boa was so frustrated. He still doesn't <laughs> like to talk about it to this day. Three foul balls and he finally grounded out to third on his fourth bat. Three balls, one strike to Tony Gwynn. He has been on fire lately. Two hits yesterday. He drops one into left field, but it will be the third out of the inning. Taken care of by Glenn Wilson. One, two, three inning for Jim Deshays. We head to the second with the Astros leading one nothing. Here's the Sears diehard starting lineups for the Houston Astros. They'll lead things off with their center fielder Eric Yelding. Batting second is Bill Dorn. Then it's Craig Vigio, the catcher, hitting fourth. Glenn Davis, hotter hitter in baseball. Then it's Ken Cabinetti, Glenn Wilson, and Eric Anthony. Hitting eighth is Rafael Ramirez and then Jim Deshaies. Checking the defense quickly. Biff Roberts at third, Gary Templeton at short, Roberto Alomar at second, and Jack Clark at first. Sean Abner, Joe Carter, and Tony Gwynn in the outfield. Benito Santiago catching in Dennis Rasmussen in search of victory number six this year on the Hill. And the lead off the second is Eric Anthony, and Dennis Rasmussen throws him a fastball that misses the outside corner of the plate. Ball one. Anthony Ramirez and Deshays here in the second. Anthony, one of the most highly touted prospects this year has tremendous power and he fouls one up here. It's one ball and one strike. He has four home runs and eight RBIs this year. But he hit one in May that they're talking about still in Houston into the upper deck in right field in Houston. If you've ever been to the Astros, I mean, that is a shot well past 440 feet. First Astro to hit one in the upper deck in right field ever. Bernie Carbo of Cincinnati did it. Four guys have hit it in the upper deck and left field. Doug Rader, Greg Luzinski, Bob Bailey, and Jimmy Wins. Andre Dawson also, so that's five. So there's seven all together. My math wasn't too good. Here's the one-two pitch. Fastball, base hit right field. So Anthony is on. And he was held back a little bit the last week of May and also the first week of June because of injuries to his legs, but he had very good speed. Well, we heard a few hoops and hollers down below us. Eric Anthony hails from San Diego, although he did move to Houston for his senior year in high school. But I think Eric's got a few passes here tonight. Here's Rafael Ramirez. One for three last night. There's only four hits in his last 29 at bats, so he has been slumping. Astros leading one nothing as we're in the second inning of play. And once again, you'll see Rasmussen go quite often to first base. Well, the only thing that will keep Jim Deshaies from going often to first base is not have anybody on first base. <laughs> <laughs> he got through the side in order in the first inning. And Rasmussen has struggled from the very outset. He had the bases loaded, only one out in the first, and was able to squeak out with just one run scoring. So that helped him. There's Mont Galante over at third base. Raphael has been slumping as Steve told you he is a 360 lifetime hitter though against Dennis Rasmussen so he's probably looking forward to this assignment tonight maybe he can bust loose. Anthony a short lead at first. Jim Deshaies on deck is a terrible hitting pitcher so I think Raphael wants to get on base to let Deshaies hit Deshaies is 0 for 18 this year with 13 strikeouts. Anthony not going pitch stays high one ball one strike. Yeah the value of putting the hit and run on here is diminished somewhat by Deshaies inability to do much with a bat even if you get the guy to first and third you're probably going to still have Deshaies try to bunt Ramirez down to second base so I don't look for the Astros to put a hit and run on we'll see though. One ball one strike. Goes to right field but it's fouls one ball and two strikes and you know look at Rafael. 
he's looking pretty good. He's, he's slimmed down from uh, years past when he was at the Atlanta Braves and was up to about 215 pounds for a shortstop. He was only 5'11". There's Art Howe, the skipper of the Houston Astros. Well, for years, everybody said the reason Rafael Ramirez led the league in errors was because of the bad infield in Atlanta. A very tough infield to play on, but when he came over to Houston, he's led the league in errors a couple of times on the AstroTurf. And another 30 error season in 1989. Yeah, Rafi needs to lead the league one more time to become the undisputed record holder. He shares it with Dick Grote, the former Pirate shortstop, for leading the league in errors six different times in his career. Anthony has four stolen bases this year. Has yet to be caught. He's not going, and there's a ground ball, third baseman. Bib Roberts gets the force and gets the double. No, they don't. Ramirez is able to beat it out. Padres did everything right but two things happened. Rafael Ramirez was leaning a little bit towards first base and Steve you mentioned taking the weight off that's probably given him about an additional half step and that's what he makes it by so Padres really executed but you see Rafi on his way to first base Biff Roberts gives Alomar a good throw and Robbie makes a fine pivot and a strong throw but first base umpire Ooh. Paul Rungi says safe when it looked on the replay like maybe out. That angle, he looks safe. It's a runner on first base, and here's Jim Deshays. He's in a bunning situation. Dave chronicled his difficulties this year. Now, notice the difference. When we see Will Clark with that great determination on his face when he comes to the plate, look at Deshays going, God, I hope I get the bunt sign so I can <laughs> get it down and get out of here. <laughs> I mean, Clark has a look on his face like, Mr. Pitcher, you got problems you're facing Will Clark. Jim Deshaies has a look on the face. Boy, how am I going to get that put down? Boy, that guy's <laughs> six, seven out there. He looks like he's coming right around by first base. Kind of hope I can lay a bunt down here. A look of concern. I'll tell you what, it's not real easy to bunt a guy if you're a left-handed batter like Rasmus and all arms and legs and six foot seven. Here's the 2 0 -oh count. Inside corner, two and one. This is where you really have to lay down a good bunt. Bip Roberts is quick at third. Santiago very quick at coming out from behind the plate. If you can make Clark or Rasmussen field the ball, you have a pretty good chance of getting the sacrifice successfully because Jack's got a long run. And Rasmussen, not a real smooth fielding pitcher because of a childhood injury he had to his ankle. Runner going. And out at second base is Rafael Ramirez. Nice throw from Benito Santiago. Well, it's very apparent tonight that manager Art Howe, who has seen his team lose four games in a row, is trying to get very aggressive. I think maybe they had bunt and run on there, and Ras uh, and uh, Deshays did not even offer it the ball. And second base umpire Mike Winters says, out you go. So Benito Santiago, one for three tonight on stolen base attempts. And striking out is Jim Deshays. So we'll head to the bottom of the second inning with Houston and Deshaies right now leading 1 0 over San Diego. Don't miss the action in San Diego Jeff Murphy Stadium as a fundraise battle. Hello, I'm John Saunders. If it happens in baseball, you'll see it here on ESPN. Except for Sunday night games, Major League Baseball usually requires us to show you an alternate game when your home team is featured in ESPN's national coverage. You won't see your home team play that night on ESPN, but you will see an exciting game sure to be a key matchup so tune in Tuesdays Wednesdays Fridays and Sundays ESPN in your cable system cover the national pastime full time Steve Fiziak and Dave Campbell in San Diego California where the Astros lead the Padres one nothing and San Diego came into tonight's game with a record of 26 and 24 second place nine games back of Cincinnati but when you look at the offensive situations they're very even it's the pitching that has deprived San Diego thus far, Dave. Well, obviously the Padres are leading the Reds in run scored, but pitching, keeping the ball in the ballpark, Padres had trouble with a gopher ball a year ago. We mentioned they gave up 133, and this ballpark yielded 148, most in the National League. I don't know why they keep calling Atlanta the launching pad and Wrigley, Wrigley Field the home run haven. This ballpark.
because of no wind the fact that the fences are very fair distance and low fences the ball just sails out of here particularly on warm evenings as it is tonight started this evening at 75 degrees slight breeze from the southwest at three miles an hour and there's the Bain brain trust of the Houston Astros and they'll send Jim Deshays to work he'll face Joe Carter Jack Clark and Benito Santiago here in the second so you got a feel for the Atlanta Braves a little bit they go out and try to really bolster their ball club this year picking up veteran Ernie Witt getting Nick Azaski. Witt just went on the disabled list with a bad thumb. Azaski has been transferred to the 60 day disabled list by that mysterious vertigo that he's suffering from. And the great young pitching Atlanta expected to have really has not materialized. And Bobby Cox a very solid baseball man down at Atlanta along with Russ Nixon. I mean doesn't matter what they seem to do. Nothing's going right for him right now. Here's the 1 0 pitch to Joe Carter and he hits one high in the air in left center field. Eric Yelding is called up by Glenn Wilson and makes the catch. Interesting story. Glenn Wilson always plays right field and is an outstanding right fielder. He's one of the best arms in baseball. But he's been shifted left because Anthony, the freshman, feels so much more comfortable in right than he does in left. Yeah, I don't think it's any doubt Glenn Wilson has been shifted from a few clubs recently. He started out with Detroit, went to the Phillies, Pittsburgh, and Houston. Uh, Glenn's really going to have to put together some numbers to stick around the big leagues for a while. He's kind of the extra man, odd man out right now. Well, San Diego activated Jack Clark yesterday, and this is first plate appearance since May 5th when he got hurt. Been out with a back injury. Also was hit in the cheek, broke his cheek late in May on a toss from Pat Clements in batting practice. Outside corner to Jack one ball and one strike. Well there was talk that they were going to construct a special face mask for Jack uh, to hit with but obviously he's just using the normal flap on the helmet right now. He had the surgery on the cheek about two weeks ago. Outside corner one ball two strikes Deshay is going right after Jack Clark and talking with Jack McKeon and I asked him I said did you want to get him back in there first of all because he's got a great back but he's one guy who puts fear in the other pitchers line he says absolutely he is one guy who does scare other teams pitching staffs and here is a fly ball to left field towered in the air down the foul line and no one will get there Ken Caminiti Glenn Wilson and Rafael Ramirez all searching for it, it was hit a mile high and they had to pull it out of the twilight. Well, when the ball goes above the lights here in San Diego Jack Murphy Stadium, that ball was really up in the air. It's still not quite totally dark here. And you see those guys kind of looking at each other. Where is it? Where is it? That ball really has to be caught under normal conditions. It was in the air way too long, but all three of them looked at each other. I don't think any of them really had, had a real good read on the ball. Another five to ten minutes, it'll be totally dark here. The Shays last year, 15 and 10. Here's the one two to Jack Clark off speed pitch struck him out. That's a second strikeout for Deshays in the game. That's not a bad at bat though for Jack Clark. He looked at three pitches. That's not a bad idea. You've been off for a month. Came back got very good wood on that high foul ball and then got cool on the changeup. But you know not a bad idea. Some hitters when they get back in the lineup the younger guys well they want to hit the first pitch they see and Clark was just measuring Deshays a little bit getting a read on him for later at bats in the ball game. That takes us to the catcher Benito Santiago. Benito last night went one for three. They walked Joe Carter to get to Benito to load the bases, and he promptly slapped one in to left field for a base hit that scored two. Well, you think the Padres had a catching tandem here with Benito and Sandy Alomar Jr. laying in the wings. Alomar leading the American League All Star ballot in catchers, sitting over 500 with men in scoring position with two outs is Sandy Alomar Jr. Right field. That's the first base hit off Jim Deshays in this game. Well, Santiago now nine for his last 22, well over 400. So Benito just one of several Padre hitters that's very hot with the bat. Left fielder, number 28, Sean After. Benito just kind of fights this one inside out, draws the arms in and pushes it off to right center field. And Eric Anthony comes in and plays it on the big hop. And Santiago aboard at first with two down and Abner steps in. Number one draft choice in the nation way back in 1984 was it? 84 you think about Sean Abner they keep saying waited for the kid to develop and now he may be a part time player. He's still only 23 years old and I'm telling you this kid has got some excellent tools. I think he has to go somewhere where he can play every day. He played for one out last night. It was 
breaking ball on the outside corner for strike one. He came in as a defensive replacement in left field, makes a fantastic catch, and then they pull a double switch and take Abner out. I mean, he made a tremendous catch. I told Sean that Jack McKeon was saving him for tonight so he could get in the starting lineup. Didn't want to wear him <laughs> out last night. And he said, yeah, right. Sean's got a good sense of humor. He's really a talented player. He's, he's an excellent defensive outfielder, good fly hawk, good arm. The question is the bat. And the Shays with his first throw over the night. He averages 14 a game, but he finally got a man to first base and tossed over there. I don't know. I'm trying to think of a club that Abner might be able to go to. I mean, he's hit 300 in Triple A. He doesn't really have anything to prove down there. Up high, and they have a talented group of young outfielders: Gerald Clark, Darren Jackson. They have a couple of play people that could start for a lot of uh, clubs. Uh, as we take a look at the baseball commissioner, Faye Vincent, and also Steve Greenberg, his assistant. And uh, Steve, of course, the son of one of the great Hall of Famers, Hank Greenberg. Yeah, Steve's doing his bit. He's eating peanuts at the ballpark. That's what he's <laughs> supposed to do. Two throws for Deshaies the first. I'm going to keep track. Of that. You do that. <laughs> CBS 355 by the end of the game. That's what he had all last year. Well, Roger Clements of the Red Sox was number two at 297. So I didn't think he had that many base runners. Amazing thing about Deshaies is he led in throwing over to first base, but base runners still had a better stolen base ratio against him than the major league average, which is .74 stolen bases per game. They were .84 off Deshaies. Good changeup though from Jim and Abner way out in front. One ball, two strikes, two outs. Runner at first base in Benito Santiago. One nothing score. Houston has the lead. They did that in the first inning when. Ken Caminiti hit a fly ball to right field, scoring Eric Yelding from third base. Runner going, pitch is hit in the air, popped up, and it will be out of play. The Santiago either had Deshays red or guessed right because the catcher Craig Biggio had absolutely no chance. Santiago had about four steps at the second base before Deshays even got the ball halfway to the plate. You're looking at Deshays, and you mentioned about Mike Scott. Last year, when Deshays and Scott started ball games, the Astros went 45 and 22. Other pitchers started, the team went 41 and 54. So that's what Deshays and Scott meant to the Astros a year ago. Those two guys, when they pitched, the Astros were 23 games above 500. Santiago again going ground ball Ramirez, but this will end the inning as the play goes 6 3 in Houston, still leading 1 0 over the San Diego Padres as we head to inning number three. Third inning we go. Houston has a 1 0 lead on San Diego, and this copyright telecast is presented by authority of Major League Baseball and may not be reproduced or retransmitted in any form without the express written consent. Of Major League Baseball. Just and we did talk to the commissioner before the game tonight, and he said, "Make sure you read that." And we did. You know, it was your turn too. Yeah, I know it. Well, next time. <laughs> <laughs> Up in Seattle, huh? No, in Oakland. We've got Eric Yelling to lead things off. The only man who has come around to score in this ball game tries to bunt his way on for the second straight time. This time, tagged out by Jack Clark, one down. Well, it appears they're trying to pick on Jack tonight. Clark not noted for the great defense. In fact, when Yelding bunted the first time up, he bunted it straight back to Rasmussen. But Clark, who has not been out there for a month, and his eagerness to go after the ball went after the ball, and that left Robbie Alomar to have to cover first. And Yelding ended up being safe, so that play ended up costing the Padres a run back in the first inning. That takes us to Billy Doran. He walked his first time up, was left stranded at third base. Pitch to him is in there. Strike one. And Jack Clark was more concerned about how he would play defensively tonight than he would at the play. Those are look at Doran's numbers the last three years as he sends a ground ball to Gary Templeton. And there's two out. Wait, now we've documented it on telecast before. I don't know if we've gone into the areas that we're going into tonight, how That's Doran true. really struggled right, in the second half of last year, batting like 171 the second half. You know, but he still led the club and go ahead RBIs with 22. So Bill Doran is a very productive player who just happened to have a terrible second half of 1989. And he was one of those guys who had the ability to look in the mirror and say, hey, buddy, it was your fault. There are so many guys in this business who put the blame on others, but Bill Doran, a true professional. Here's the catcher, Craig Biggio. Now Fastball Doran, stays high. Doran's comment was, nobody in America did their job worse than I did last year. 
It's common about slumps. Nobody says they're in a slump anymore. <laughs> they just say they're in a Billy Doran. We're going into Cincinnati where he is from and he is a delightful professional. I mean right from the word go and there are many who felt that he put undue pressure on himself last year that he is such an intense competitor that perhaps he just pressed too much and thought about it too much. He went from July 12th to August 17th. That's a span of 35 days and hit 077. Now that mm. is a slump. Fastball stays high and outside. Three balls, no strikes to Craig Biggio. And you've been to the Astrodome before, and you can hear the guys with a temper go down that clubhouse runway and smash their bats up against the runway. And Doran did it louder than, <laughs> than nobody else on that team. Anybody. Four straight balls out of the strike zone to Craig Biggio, and he comes up with Glenn Davis, who will be pitched to for the first time in this game. Last time, he had runners in second and third, and they first said, Davis, first base is yours. Well, even though Biggio is a stolen base threat, Craig has stolen eight this year. He had 21 last year, but Craig, stay there if you want Glenn Davis to hit, because you steal second base, the automatic pass goes out. So in this case, Biggio might run if Davis gets two strikes on him, but if he runs up to two strikes, I'm going to be a very surprised hombre. <laughs> he went one for four last night. Home run number 16. That leads the National League. Two better than Kevin Mitchell of the San Francisco Giants. I told you he had six in his last four, including three on Friday. He set a club record with four in two games. He hit three on Friday and another on Saturday. That was Glenn's second three home run game. The other one took place here at this ballpark in 1987. Misses outside. One ball, no strikes. They'll stay away from his power as Vigio over on first base. <laughs> Better percentage than two, three of the fastest men in all of baseball. Yeah, but this time, Art Howe's got a lasso around his neck. Don't take the bat out of the big bopper's hands. Breaking pitch back up the middle through the legs of Rasmussen and bobbling the ball is Roberto Alomar. That is the third error for San Diego in this game. Now Davis cracks his bat and hits a crazy spinner out to Roberto. When he fumbled the ball though, he really had plenty of time to go to first base, but he was so intent on going to second and obviously a tie there. And second base umpire Mike Winters says a tie goes to the runner, and he's right. And boom, Alomar and Biggio, or Biggio arrive at the same time. That takes us to Ken Caminiti. He drove in the Astros' only run of this game, the only run we've had from both clubs in the contest. As it's a one-nothing ball game here in the third, and Rasmussen with the breaking ball, staying low. Padres also have not played well in the defensive end this year, and they have some very talented defensive performers. But for Alomar, that's his eighth there. Santiago's committed eight. And they've made them at bad times. The Padres seem to make errors in clusters. They already have three tonight. Snap toss second base. Vigio gets back in. Runners at first and second. Two outs in the third. Houston leading one nothing. Well depending on which book you read the Padre press guide which says Benito Santiago picked off 16 runners last year including seven at second base or the stats incorporated book which says he picked off 14. Regardless, the second best was Charlie O'Brien of Milwaukee with five. So you're looking at a guy that's a dangerous weapon behind the plate, throwing, and runners cannot stray too far off the bases. Two balls in one strike to Ken Caminiti. I'll tell you who the prime guy for Santiago to pick off second base is, and that's the guy at the plate right now, Ken Caminiti. Caminiti scored on 23 out of 24 outfield singles from second base. That means he's a very aggressive base runner. And Santiago, if Caminiti gets the second tonight with that aggressive lead, Santiago may be tossing through to second. Two balls, one strike, two outs. And the left hander deals and it stays high. Three balls and one strike. And Caminiti from the San Jose, California area. Last year he hit 255 with 10 home runs and 72 RBIs, so he made his plate appearances 
very productive. Vigios at second base. Davis at first. Two outs. And this the third inning with Houston already leading one nothing. San Diego started tonight. Nine back of Cincinnati. They're taking on San Francisco this evening. And there's a ground ball foul. The National League champions have struggled this year. But right now it's a nothing nothing ball game in the third inning up in the Bay Area. Reds were bombed last night by the Giants and John Burkett's first career complete game in the major leagues. Rasmus and his delivery has been smoothed out a lot this year by Pat Dobson. Last year Rasmussen was very herky jerky. And Comes off the mound. Dennis will just keep Biggio close at second base. Dennis has a very slow delivery to the plate and he's very prone to giving up the stolen base at third but with two outs not quite the threat it would be with one out. Runners going with two outs and Caminiti fouls it back. It stays at three balls and two strikes two outs. Glenn Davis also doing a smart thing there. He did not have a real big lead at first base and when you're going to go three and two with two outs. You don't want that first baseman to sneak in behind you. So in this case, you just want to make sure that pitcher delivers to the plate. Tammany sprays at foul. Mets got their second win under Buddy Harrelson tonight as they knock off Montreal six to five. A lot of six to five, seven to five games tonight. The moons must be in alignment for the batters this evening as to the pitchers opposed to the pitcher. How about Ramon Martinez last night of the Dodgers with 18 strikeouts. And he got number 18 in the eighth inning and could not nail down number 19 and break Sandy Koufax's record that he did twice. Three balls two strikes to Ken Caminiti with two on two out. Runners go again a pitch high and outside ball four. So Rasmussen has struggled all three innings. He has walked the bases loaded here. He has three walks in the game. Excuse me four walks in the game. One was of the intentional variety. And he is just flirting with disaster in a time where San Diego really needs help. I mean they've won eight of their last eleven ever since that uh, player clubhouse meeting where Tony Gwynn was uh, uh, taken under very undue situation. Glenn Wilson with a line drive foul down the right field side. You may have heard all about it where Tony Gwynn was there was some criticism actually before we get to the Gwynn matter there was some criticism by Mike Pellarulo who said there was a player in the club who was playing only for himself was only concerned about his at bats. Take a look at the Padres. They have not allowed a grand slam since 1988. But uh, Tony Gwynn thought it was that he that Pally Rulla was talking about although Pag said that was not the case. He was just talking about situations still. They had a clubhouse meeting got their differences settled and they've won eight of the last eleven. The only problem is they've only gained a half game on Cincinnati. Well, I'll tell you something else about that uh, incident in New York. I think the wounds are extremely deep in Tony Gwynn. I know Tony. I haven't talked to him, but I know the type of person he is, and I don't think it's the kind of wounds that are going to heal. The Padres may have won eight out of eleven, but I don't think this problem has gone away. Base is loaded here in the third. The one-one pitch. Two balls and one strike. And. It is an unusual situation. It's almost like a family where you have to get them together and say, hey, fellas, apologize. Or mom and dad bring brother and brother who are been upset with each other. Tell them you're sorry. And they almost have to do that. Wilson, right field. Wynn backs up near the warning track, makes the catch. And Dennis Rasmussen walking a tightrope here in the third. Gets out. ESPN Baseball Tonight, brought to you by Mitsubishi, bringing you a full line of award-winning automobiles. See them all at your Mitsubishi Motors dealer. By AT&T, the right choice. By the Beef Industry Council and Beef Board. Beef, real food for real people. And by Bud Light. Everything else is just a light. 
just another beautiful evening in paradise. San Diego, California, it's 75 degrees outside, not a cloud in the sky, and it has been that way, well, since, <laughs> since San Diego was, was born. I mean, this place is absolutely beautiful. And there is a look at the way they dress on a typical evening in Southern California. Well, Jim Deshaies is in the bottom of the third. We'll face Gary Templeton, Dennis Rasmussen, and then back to the top of the order in Biff Roberts. Templeton, outstanding night last night with four for five. He's hitting 404 in his last eight games. Deshaies has allowed just one base runner. That Benito Santiago had a line drive base at the right field, and Templeton drives one down the right field side. Long run. Will they get there? They say it's a foul ball. First base umpire, Paul Rungi, came right out quickly and said foul. Not by much, though. I always like it when the umpires hustle. Great job by Paul Rungi. He was off at the crack of the bat. And we'll see if we get chalk or if it's dust on the outside. And hmm. don't know. A little dust. But Rungi went out and had a great look. And that's what you ask an umpire to do. And it looks like dust to me. It looks like brown dirt as opposed to white chalk spray. Deshaies has been doing with that his left shoulder throughout the start of this ball game. Now he has had shoulder problems in his past. Another interesting note on Deshaies. He got traded from the Yankees in 1985 in September. Since then, he has won 52 ball games. No Yankee pitcher in that span has won more than 29. So another one that got away from the Yankees. They traded him for Joe Necro. 1985 so they traded away another great young prospect for an aging veteran which has been some of the Yankee problems over the years. Did you like the trade of Lance McCullers and Clay to Detroit for Matt Noakes. Well, I think Lance McCullers has always had a great arm he's been coveted by many teams he's really an enigma from the standpoint he just doesn't get people out on a consistent basis and he has a terrific changeup, a, a good fastball but for whatever reason. He ends up giving up a lot of gopher balls in not so good situations, and he's also prone to walking men with the bases loaded during his career, which is hurting. One ball, two strikes to Gary Templeton. He came in with a 263 average. Been on fire. The four hits last night, all of them singles. Reaches out, pops a foul. Play for Biggio, no. Tell you, you really have to feel for Bucky Dent, the manager of the Yankees. He's under a tremendous amount of pressure there, but I think he has handled it so beautifully. He just he had a meeting last week with his players and said, Hey, do not let my situation affect you. You guys go out and play your game. Don't worry about me. If I'm gonna stay, I'm gonna stay. If I'm gonna go, I'm gonna go. But he's really handled it very, very well. That's not to mean he's gonna stay, but I think Dent has had a very professional attitude in the Bronx Zoo, which is always a tough place to manage. Base hit left field. Second hit off to Shays in the game. And that takes us to the pitching spot and Dennis Rasmussen. Now normally you'd say hey easy out of here this guy will be sacrificing. He may be sacrificing. But the guy who's coming to the plate is hitting 368. Here's a look at Templeton's hitting style. He's five for his last six. Now the Shays got a change up over to Gary but got it up the previous change up was down location the key and with it up Templeton who tries to hit the left handers to right field will pull the change up in the hole to left. I don't think Templeton's a good guy to throw a change up to unless you're going to throw it in the dirt. Hmm. Snuck the fastball right by him. You know, Rasmussen going for the slug bun or the butcher boy whatever you want to call it not a bad play you square around a guy that has pretty good back control like Rasmussen let him take a pop because Caminetti was charging as was Glenn Davis at first and Rafael Ramirez was running over to cover second. Deshaies is going back to work how many is that for him thus far. Uh, four that I've counted he's only had two base runners. Up. But I may miss one along the way. <laughs> no balls one strike to Dennis Rasmussen. Now Deshaies is the type of guy that does have to go over. There's the bunt. Nicely done. Only play first base. And Deshaies loops it to Bill Doran. One out. Pitchers who can help themselves like that are usually rewarded later in the ballgame. Let's see if Roberts or Alomar can help. Now, Dennis, with excellent bunting technique, now you see how he deadened the ball. He brought both hands back to deaden the ball. Too many hitters when they try to deaden the ball they take that top hand and pull it back and all that does is aim the bat into foul territory. 
if you're going to deaden the bat, you bring both hands back simultaneously. And Rasmussen with outstanding execution on the sacrifice there. Here's Bip Roberts. Ball one. Bip again with three hits last night. He has a 12 game hitting streak that ties Ali Arulo, Wynn, Santiago for the longest this year. And during that streak, he's hitting near 390. Good speed at second base and Gary Templeton. Top foul. You know, we said earlier in the telecast, Glenn Davis, the hottest hitter in the National League, well, the hottest power hitter for sure. Yes. Let's not forget Lenny Dykstra. Yeah, they had put seven on the board tonight, and wonder how many hits Lenny had tonight. They're leading St. Louis seven to five, still in the top yeah. of the ninth yeah. inning. Well, the Phillies St. were trailing Louis. three nothing, or they had three nothing in the game. Then the Cardinals went ahead five three, and now Philadelphia back on top seven five. Grab ball up the middle, backhanded by Doran. No play. He goes to third, and they can't get the man there. Kimbledon was not lured by Billy Doran. Terrific play by Doran. He's got no shot at Bip Roberts, a speedster at first base, and he's just hoping Templeton will take the bait and come around. But Sandy Alomar, the third base coach, wisely alerted Templeton to the play. And Doran looking at Templeton all the way. He knows he's got no shot at first base. So Biff Roberts now has the longest Padre hitting streak of the year, 13 games. Runners in the corners, one out. Let's see if Roberts is going, trying to stay out of that double play. Infield comes in just a tad. And DeShays does what he does best. Well, we won't say he does it best, but he does Number what he one. does most. Okay. <laughs> and that's sort of first base. And again, Deshaies is the type of guy that has to go over because he has such a high leg kick to the plate. If he didn't go over once in a while, the track meet would be on as soon as he came set. He does have that high leg kick, and he does not give Biggio much of a chance to throw anybody out. Roberto Alomar, last year in the first half, last year in the second half, and he came out on fire this year. 3.30 to start this ball game in the top ten of the National League. And last night, you and I watched the game his first time, three times up, he lined out. His dad was just saying, hang in there. Those things happen. Line out hard to the right fielder, then to the left fielder. And Roberts having to dive back in may have jammed his arm. Well, this is a case where Bip really was his own worst enemy because he did not hustle back after the pitch. So whatever injury he sustained, it was his own fault. He just kind of was wandering off first base. All of a sudden saw Biggio snap a throw down. Let's see if he gets tagged in the face. Yeah, right in the nose. That one hurts. <laughs> Bip's mom and dad probably watching up in the Bay Area tonight saying, don't do that to my son, Glenn. He'll be okay, though. <laughs> Glenn, I think, smiling. It wasn't intentional. The first baseman had it back to the play. He's just slapping the tag down there. Bip got his nose in the way. Two balls, no strikes. Shea's going to first again. Roberto Alomar standing with the count two balls and no strikes. Houston leads one nothing. We're in the bottom of the third inning of play. Roberts not going and the pitch is hit in the air. Center field long run. Eric Yeldon will he get there? No. Base hit. We are tied at one. As scoring from third base Gary Templeton. Well, the Astros have not taken advantage of their opportunities. The first time the Padres get one, they get a lead single, an excellent sacrifice bunt, infield hit, and a bloop. But Padres are executing. The Astros aren't, and Art Howe fully aware of that as Robbie bloops one into center field. When you're in a bad streak like the Astros are right now, loses a four straight. You've never seemed to execute too well, and the Padres, conversely, winners of eight of their last 11, seem to take advantage of most opportunities. And that takes us to Tony Gwynn and saw the way Art Howe trying to direct his defense. Now, they really played Tony Gwynn shallow and left, and they're doing it again tonight. They're regular in move towards left center. Eric Yelding, the center fielder. Right fielder is Eric Anthony, he is in his normal position at right but the left fielder scooted around towards the left field line and very shallow because Gwynn likes to drop those base hits in there. Yeah but I think uh, Glenn Wilson could be playing too shallow. Gwynn's got good power to left field and I'll tell you it's not going to take too much to get one over Wilson's head. 
Stubbs was playing even more shot last night. Tony had two hits last night and a big clutch hit in the ninth inning. Team was just leading 3-1. Bases were loaded, and Gwynn punched one through the right side, drove in two. Runners on first and second. Tie game now at one. Fastball is in there. Two and one. Well, not the ideal time to try to pull a double steal with a left-handed batter up, but again with Deshays with a very slow motion to the plate. Padres last night with the same duo aboard pulled a double steal. So we'll see. One out's the time to do it. You like to have a right-handed batter up so that catcher doesn't have a free throw to third base. Tony Swain loops it to center. Long run yelling. No ill. It's a base hit. Here comes Vip Roberts. Here comes the throw. Safe at the plate. It's 2-1 San Diego. Well, if you watch the Boston-New York game earlier, a lot of times the ball was thrown to the wrong base on base hits. This is a case where Eric Yelding had Robbie Alomar hung out to dry coming around second base, elected to go to the plate. Not only did he not get Biff Roberts, he allowed Alomar to go to third, Gwynn to second. Very bad decision by Eric Yelding. You see Alomar, he was right between second and third, all hung out to dry, and Yelding decided to go after the man at the plate who he had no chance against Biff Roberts and now they're going to walk Joe Carter and take their chances with Jack Clark. So Houston not executing well at all and they have not been in the last five games and those things disturb a manager more than just about anything else. Base on balls and failure to execute the fundamentals really will drive a manager up the wall. In Yielding's defense he's played six positions and the normal center fielder Gerald Young may not have done that but he's down in triple A baseball because he got off to a horrible start this year. Yielding has played all three outfield positions second base third base and shortstop. So Art Howe will walk Joe Carter and a pitch to Joe Clark who he struck out back in the second. San Diego has claimed a 2-1 lead here. As RBI singles by Roberto Alomar and Tony Gwynn have plated Gary Templeton and Biff Roberts. Well, I'll tell you what, there haven't been too many times in Jack Clark's career that they have walked a right-handed batter to get to him. Once in a while, they probably walked Don Mattingly against right-handed pitching in New York, but for a left-handed pitcher to walk the man in front of Jack Clark, you can probably count the number of times on one hand that's happened in his career. You know, I had a wonderful conversation with Jack Clark before the ball game, and he was talking about how pitching has changed. We have a 2-1 ball game here as San Diego has the lead on the Houston Astros, and he was saying that he used to love the challenges of the great pitchers of Don Sutton, of Nolan Ryan, and it, he, he thinks it's changed just a little bit. And a lot of it, he says, has to do with the contracts that they're handing out. Well, there's a look at Clark and what he's done with the bases full. He has one with San Diego, seven in his career. But he says he's coming back and he said he really needs to get back in this lineup. Said the old timers used to really challenge you. Let's change. They like to work the corners play more American Legion style not American League style American Legion style he called it. Big part of the ball game for Deshaies he's on the ropes right now he's got to get a double play grounder. One ball, one strike. Yeah, Deshaies has been victimized by a lot of cheap hits in the inning, but on the other side of the coin, the cheap hits have come off pitches up in the strike zone. That's when you give up the bloops. You don't give up the bloops on pitches down. They, when you fist the hitters and it's above the waist, and that's what Robbie Alomar and Tony Gwynn both did. So a little bit of bad luck, but also some bad location by Deshaies. Grab ball. Rasmussen's going home. They get the force there. Bases will remain loaded. With two outs now. I tell you, Deshaies certainly was not graceful on the play, and credit Craig Biggio making a good play at the plate. I mean, Deshaies unloaded a fastball to Biggio and had to get it to him in a hurry. And Deshaies really rifles one to Biggio, a low throw, and Craig gets it just in front of Alomar, who's forced at the plate. Good play by Craig Biggio, and give credit to Deshaies for getting off the mound, although he gave his catcher an awfully tough throw to handle. And I tell you, Jack Clark threw the bat. Out near where Deshaies was. But he gets to play. Base is still loaded. And here comes Benito Santiago, who sent a base into right field his first time up. He had a pair of RBIs last night and a 10 2 Padre win. Fastball stays inside. 
Cincinnati and San Francisco remain scoreless during the fourth inning. Well, the Shea's out of the frying pan, but certainly not out of the fire. Santiago has really been swinging the bat well the last five ball games for San Diego. He's a very confident hitter right now, and DeShays is going to have to make good pitches to retire it. 420 in his last six games with seven RBIs. One and one. Oakland A's juggernaut continues to roll. You know, it seems though Mark McGuire, he hits all of his home runs in twos. I believe that's the fourth time this year he's had two home runs in a game. A's beat Texas 7 to 4 tonight. Gwynn at third, Carter at second, Clark at first. Two outs. Two runs already in for San Diego. They've taken a 2 1 lead here, trying to. Crawl back in that National League West. The Reds getting out to just a tremendous start this year. 33 wins, 13 losses. This is inside. Two and one. Now the Shays has not been able to ring up that fastball in the inside corner. He's coming in on the hitters, trying to set up the changeup down and away, but he's missed with the changeup because he's been getting it up, and he isn't quite getting the inside corner with the fastball. So he's just a little out of sync. Not much off, but just enough to keep him in trouble. Here's the 2 1 pitch. This is low. Three balls and one strike. So one pitch away from walking in the third run of this game. And no one is warming up down in that Astro bullpen. There's our house. Now the Shea's in trouble right here. Three and one, bases loaded. We'll find out what his strike pitch is tonight. Santiago is going to be sitting all over the fastball. Let's see if Jim might come with a slider or if he challenges him with his best heat. I don't think he's had enough control of the changeup to throw it here. High fastball, maybe. No low fastball. It's out of the strike zone, and he walks in a run. In comes Tony Gwynn, and San Diego has a three-to-one lead. Now the Shea certainly has had good luck against the rest of the National League in his tenure, but against the Padres, he's lost seven decisions in a row, and he's not a sharp pitcher tonight. Two and seven lifetime against San Diego, but 0 for his last seven. This is the three one pitch and it's not even close to Benito. I mean you can call that one at home folks. That takes it to Sean Abner. Ground out victim his last time up. And he hits it hard in the air center field. Yelling had it played perfectly. Makes the catch. Three runs across for San Diego though in the bottom of the third. And we head to the fourth with the Padres now leading three one. San Diego has a 3 1 lead on the Houston Astros. Steve Fiziak and Dave Campbell with you from Jack Murphy Stadium in San Diego. Well, tomorrow night, get ready for one of the greatest rivalries in all of sports. The Yankees face the Red Sox tomorrow night at 7 30 Eastern, live here on ESPN. Tonight's ball game went the Red Sox way in a dandy 9 8. And I just got finished with an outstanding right book about that series, Anthony. Summer of 49, by David Halberstam. And whoa. It was wonderful to, to read about Joe DiMaggio and Ted Williams and, and Bertie Tebbets. Scout now, but he was a good little catcher there. You know. Here's Eric Anthony. Pops one up. Down the right field line. Top play for Roberto Allen. Makes it. <laughs> Tony Gwynn nodded to Robbie and said, I'm glad you tried that one. That was really up in the air. The Anthony really has a lot of power in that swing. Number 16, shortstop. Rafael Ramirez. One out now that takes us to Rafael Ramirez. Reaching a fielder's choice stole a base back in the second inning but was cut down. He's struggling four for his last 26. Tony Gwynn right field. Two outs. Well, when your club gives you the lead, that's a big inning for you. Dennis Rasmussen has gone out and gotten two outs on three pitches, and he's got the very weak hitting Jim Deshays hey, with 14 Jim strikeouts Deshaies. out of 19 at bats. So it looks like Raz has a pretty good chance of sailing through this one unscathed. And it's right after your team has scored and giving you the lead. That's always a key inning to keep the momentum on your side. Say, Pat Dobson was just 
raving about the way that Rasmussen has been throwing this year. And he just said he has simply been more aggressive. He has good stuff. Fastball on the outside corner right there. It's no balls and one strike. But he just didn't like the way he would nibble last year. Yeah, funny how pitchers go. Last year he was kind of the weak link in the Padre rotation. This year it's been Rasmussen and Ed Whitson that have really been the bellwethers. Andy Bennett starting to come along now. Bruce Hurst has struggled. Not so much that he has pitched poorly. He just has never gotten any offensive support when he's been in there. And Bennett may have had his best game of the year last night. It's two balls and one strike to Jim DeShays. Rasmussen, though, 10 and 10 last year. He had the fourth worst earned run average. For starting pitchers at 4.26. The year before, he goes 14 and 4. Seems like every other year, Dennis is on. You got the Brett Saberhagen syndrome. Only Brett gets 20 wins and then 12 wins. Yeah. 20 wins, 12 wins. Well, this is an even year. Saberhagen has pitched great in the odd years, but Brett's been coming along. He's pitched very well in the month of May and now going into June. Stays high. Three balls, two strikes. He struck out Deshays back in the second. That was his third strikeout and his last one of the game. Let's see if we see that fastball here. High fastball, and it's foul off three and two. And Joe Nuxa, broadcaster for the Cincinnati Reds and youngest pitcher of all time, who used to play for the Reds. He used to hate it when pitchers would throw the pitchers. Breaking balls. Come on, that's not fair. That shouldn't <laughs> be allowed. Kick him out of the game. High fastball again has popped up. Long run for Pip Roberts. But called off by Santiago for the final out. So Dennis Rasmussen has his first one, two, three inning of the game, and it comes here in the fourth. And the Padres hold on to a two run lead. Hello, I'm John Saunders. If it happens in baseball, you'll see it here on ESPN. Except for Sunday night games, Major League Baseball usually requires us to show you an alternate game when your home team is featured in ESPN's national coverage. You won't see your home team play that night on ESPN, but you will see an exciting game. Sure to be a key matchup, so tune in Tuesdays, Wednesdays, Fridays, and Sundays. ESPN and your cable system cover the national pastime full time. In Los Angeles, the Dodgers hosting the Atlanta Braves and an interesting night for pitcher Pete Smith. Here's the squeeze from pitcher Mike Morgan. Juan Samuel comes in to score the run. It gave the Dodgers the lead. But in the sixth inning, Pete Smith was holding on to a no-hitter. He still has it. There's two errors in the inning, a walk and a steal as well. And you saw the squeeze. That's why the Dodgers lead it one to nothing in the sixth inning. Let's get back to Steve and Dave on the coast. Pete's another one of those young pitchers in the Atlanta Braves organization that really has some outstanding stuff, and he has a chance to get a no-hitter. 3-1 here in San Diego. Dave Campbell and Steve Fiziak, and the Padres have a two-run lead. Gary Templeton will lead things off. They sent nine men to the plate in the third, scored three runs. San Diego to erase that one-nothing Astro lead. Templeton started with a base at the left, and he starts it right here with a fly ball to center field that Eric Yelding almost misjudges but makes the play on one out. Of course, that brings up two stories, and both involving the teams we're seeing tonight. Ken Johnson of the Houston Astros back in 1964, the only man to ever pitch a nine-inning no-hitter and lose. We look at Yelding making the grab here. And a guy named Clay Kirby back in 1970, the subject of a big article in the Los Angeles Times today, reminiscing 20 years ago this week. He had a no hitter going for eight innings and was taken out as his team was trailing like Pete Smith says up in Los Angeles one to nothing. Preston Gomez pinch hit for him with Cito Gaston now the manager of Toronto. There was a lot of controversy around San Diego at the time. A lot of people don't agree with me but I always say that Preston Gomez was absolutely right. The manager's job is to try to win the game. Were the Padres in the hunt? Yeah the hunt for Red October. OK. <laughs> That's the only hunt they were in. They were, the, they were in their usual hunt to try to keep from losing 100 games. Now, don't you think there's times where you go, hey, guys, we're 23 games out. Let's win one for Clay. No, not if you're the manager and your job is to win. <laughs> and the thing about it, Preston Gomez, two years later, managing the Houston Astros, did the same thing when Don Wilson had a no hitter going through eight and was behind two to nothing because of an error. And he pinch hit again. And I was playing with Houston. And he looked at me and said, Have you seen this uh, scenario before? I said, Yes, sir. And I know what you're going to do. You're going to pinch hit for him. He said, You got that right. One ball, two strikes. 
with one out. And Rasmussen now has the count, even two balls and two strikes. But even the teams, the great teams, would do that, would play for the individual plays. Even Lou Gehrig, the Iron Horseman. I remember the uh, final game of the year, great third baseman for the opposing team. Gehrig was two hits away from getting to the 300 mark, laid down two bunts, apparently had made a deal with the guy before the game. Nah, let's not turn his share of horsemen. Well, we're not. He got his two bunt singles, got his average to 300, and felt mighty comfortable. Speaking of the horse at uh, Cal Ripken Jr. playing 1,302 tonight, he needs five more games to tie Everett Scott for second place on the all time list at 1,307 games. And then there's a long bridge to Lou Gehrig at 2,130. If Ripken plays them all and there's no break in the action because of any work stop, it should take place around 1995 if Cal can keep going that long. All right, let me ask you this then. Here's Cal Ripken. It's August. He's tired. He needs a rest. You're in the hunt. Should you sit him down? No. Frank Robinson says when Cal Ripken comes to me and says he needs a night off, I give him a night off. Otherwise, he's in there. He says he's deserved the right to play. He's played through pain. He's played through illness, played through slumps. He says he knows best about his own body. Comes from uh, the old throwback. He's Jack McKeon. Old taxi driver from New Jersey. Ground ball. Nice play, Caminiti, and he has a terrific arm, and he guns out. Biff Roberts here in the fourth. 3 1, San Diego has the lead as we head to inning number five. Getting off Houston. Steve Fiziak and Dave Campbell in Jack Murphy Stadium in San Diego, where the Padres lead 3 1. Jack Murphy Stadium holds 59,022, their best regular season total, 54,732. They did that back in 1986, an opener against the Atlanta Braves. And Dennis Rasmussen goes to work here in the fifth with his team up by a pair of runs. He'll face Eric Yelding, Bill Doran, and Craig Biggio. Ken Caminiti was voted by Baseball America as having the best arm in the National League. And he showed it right there to cut down Bip Roberts. He also had the best zone rating of any third baseman in all of baseball. That means balls hit into your area that you corral. And Caminiti showed his range on that play. Breaking ball outside corner. To Eric Yeldon, he's behind. Nothing in two to Dennis Rasmussen. First round draft choice of the Toronto Blue Jays back in 1984. And went to the Cubs, was cut, picked up by Houston. And he kind of squeezes one off the end of the bat to Jack Clark for the first out of the fifth. Hey, that was a tougher play for Clark than it might have looked. Yelling kind of inside out of the ball with a half swing. That ball had a lot of crazy spin on it, like a, like off a pool cue, but Clark stayed right with it, made it look easy, but it was not that easy a play. Rasmussen has cut down the last five men that he has faced. And here's a fastball to Bill Doran, who's been on base once. He walked back in the first, grounded out in inning number three. Doran, when the season ends, he'd like to be up near the 280 mark. That's the way he thinks he normally should be. One ball, one strike. Detroit Pistons take a one game to nothing lead on the Portland Trailblazers in their best of seven series in the NBA Finals. And there's Pittsburgh beating Chicago 6-5, so the Pirates keep it going. National League East. They went in with a three game lead on Montreal. Sixth inning that is the game of the particular interest. Here in San Diego because the Padres came in nine back of the front running Reds and right now they are. Scoreless in the sixth inning of play American League Detroit over Cleveland six to two. How about those Mariners. Kansas City just cannot keep it going. California, though, seems to be making a nice little run at the Open A's. Well, they get their fifth chance tomorrow. The Angels do to try to get back to 500. They've been right at the doorstep four different times, one game under, but just can't win that next game to get to 500. They haven't been there since April 25th. So they'll get a shot tomorrow to try to go back, go back to 500. Rasmussen has the count. Three balls, two strikes to Bill Doran. He has not walked a man since the third. That was the last base runner he allowed. Bases were loaded, but he was able to get out with Glenn Wilson hit a fly ball to right field. 
Doran base hit left field. I think Tempe got false hit on that one. Sometimes as an infielder, you're looking for the call of the pitch and a particular uh, location, and you try to get that extra half step. It's called a range program, and Gary was looking for a ball to the hole. Doran hit it up the middle. You play the percentages as an infielder, and sometimes you get burned, and I think Templeton did on that ball. So man on first base, one out, and up steps number three hitter Craig Biggio. He's had a strong year hitting 285 with three home runs and 17 RBIs, and his enthusiasm is really presented itself well in the Astrodome. They love him there. Biggio came in and Art Howe handed Craig the starting catching job May 11 with Alan Ashby was placed on waivers and the Astros won 23 of their next 29. This guy is a catcher. He's an outfielder. May have seen him on Sports Center earlier this year making a marvelous catch at Shea Stadium in New York. Yeah, it looks like you got to be an American Legion ball. He's <laughs> got a real baby face. Art Howe and he had a very very interesting discussion before the ball game on framing the pitches for Jim Deshays and how to get that high strike call. Key man right now for Rasmussen because Glenn Davis who has been hot with the power is on deck. Vigio fly ball left field in comes Abner two outs. And returning to First base is Bill Dorn, and here first comes Mr. Davis. Been on base twice. He walked intentionally fast in the first and reached in an error by the second baseman Roberto Alomar in the third. It's Faye Vincent, the commissioner of baseball, on the right. Two down to his left. Scratching his nose was Steve Greenberg, Dick Freeman, the Padres president, on his immediate left. Biggest difference in the National League. He is. Outstanding at home, but has had a difficult time on the road. That was 1989. But on this road trip, he has been awesome. Six home runs in his last four games. Doran, of course, is not going anywhere at first base. Now Glenn, in addition to the six he's hit here, we mentioned a week and a half ago, had three in one day at Chicago's Wrigley Field in a doubleheader. So he's enjoyed the road this year. Ball on the outside corner. Rasmussen has stayed there all night long. But Glenn Davis last year, only two guys in baseball pulled the ball more than he did. One of them was Steve Balboni with the Yankees and Von Hayes of Philadelphia. So he's always looking for a ball to turn on. Although we did see him hit a home run to right center at Candlestick earlier. He's got power to all fields. Fastball, high one, picked up by Templeton. Scoops to second base and they get the man there. That's all they need. So Davis grounds out to end the inning, and Rasmussen clings to that 3 1 lead as we head to the bottom of the fifth. Game here in San Diego. The Padres have the lead with three on the board in that third to raise a one nothing Houston lead. And back to the mound goes Jim Deshays. He will face Roberto Alomar, Tony Gwynn, and Joe Carter here in inning number five. Alomar got a key base hit in inning number three. Right now that gave the Padres a two to one lead. Yeah, I was thinking about Ramon Martinez in that 18 strikeout game. Somehow the Los Angeles Dodgers and give credit to their scouting department year after year after year they lose a guy like Hershiser all of a sudden a guy like Ramon Martinez steps to the forefront they just get the pitching year after year they have a bad defensive team up in Los Angeles but if you strike guys out you don't have to play very good defense. <laughs> I know you had a comment uh, the other day about them defensively I remember USA Today said they may have the best the worst defense of outfield this year and I you said no wait a second they made a mistake yeah they may have a the worst defensive outfield in the history of the <laughs> National League it is flat ugly. you guys can hit Gal Daniels Kurt Gibson and Hubie Brooks you give credit where credit is due but on the defensive side I mean farewell to arms I mean those guys throws have more hang time than a Tommy Lasorda batting practice curveball <laughs> breaking pitch stays inside the count goes three balls and one strike from Jim Deshays to Roberto Alomar. Foul. 
fastball. Just misses the corner. And DeShays wanted that one. Instead, he walks his third of the game, and his third in his last two innings. Right fielder. Hey, you play Cody umpire. Blair. We don't have the perfect angle from this center field camera. See Biggio going to the backhand side. You don't know exactly where he was set up. Close pitch, but the call goes to Roberto Alomar. You know, that's what Art Howe was talking with him earlier in the ballgame, how to frame the plate so that DeShays would get that high fastball call. Best in the business, Bob Boone, and has been for a number of years. There were a couple of other guys who were outstanding. Sammy White, former catcher with the Boston Red Sox, a lot of baseball fans maybe didn't hear of him. He was an excellent defensive catcher. He's a guy that taught Mike Ryan, who's now the Philly catching coach, and Ryan taught Boone when Boone, so it's been kind of a succession as Alomar has driven back. But there really is an art to framing the pitch. A ball that's maybe a little bit outside, instead of moving your hand outside, try to catch the ball more in the webbing of your glove and keep your full hand in the strike zone. A lot of times, Bob Boone will miss pitches that are outside the strike zone with nobody on base, but it's just because he's trying to grab it towards the webbing of his glove. A lot of people think, geez, this guy's not that hot a receiver, but you never see Boone miss that pitch with men on base. You know, they were talking about, you went that ball down, you take your glove and pat it down, but also, Try and keep your glove up. Don't turn it over. Umpire time and again will not give you that call. We continue to see them trying to keep Roberto Alomar close. He had 42 stolen bases last year. And Alomar has been a go-getter again this season. The 0-1 pitch to Tony Gwynn. He checks his swing. One and one. Love the story about Robbie and of course his dad Sandy who's the third base coach who will get signs from Trader Jack who's sitting there with the arms folded but Sandy Alomar the father said I never had any disciplinary problems at all with Robbie when he was a kid he said I didn't have to spank him I didn't have to do anything I, if he misbehaved I just took his glove away from him for a couple of days and he said that was worse than spanking <laughs> or anything else a kid loved baseball so much so Roberto knew when he misbehaved the glove went in the closet and he had to sit around and pout. Deshae is trying to keep him close. What do you have him for over to first base now? I stopped counting. You, 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 forget, you lost count. Yeah, I fell asleep a couple of times when Jim was out there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you got a couple of pitches tonight, folks, that uh, you got plenty of time to stop out and get your favorite beverage in the refrigerator, go roast a couple of hot dogs, and still not miss too much action. But we knew that coming in. Two balls, one strike to Tony Gwynn. Yeah, Tom Browning, neither one of these guys are. There's Pat Dobson, the pitching coach of the San Diego Padres. Funny guy. Excellent teacher. Also, when things are going bad, he can still make you smile a little bit. <laughs> Elevation. That's his favorite, well, his least favorite word, but the one he uses most often when the pitchers are going poorly. That's why the Padres have given up 59 home runs this year. Elevation, my dear Watson. Get the ball above the waist in the middle of the plate to the big guys, and this park's not going to hold it. Well, Gwen has been ready. He's been standing in there, and Deshaies just taking his time. The count is two and one to Tony. Alomar again gets pushed back to first base, and now the crowd will howl. Now, Paul Rungi is eagle eyeing him at first base. Paul, if Deshaies does anything wrong, Rungi will ring up a balk on him. Roberto has seven stolen bases this year. He's been caught four times. And there's Amos Otis over at first base, and Gwynn goes into the alley. Long run for Eric Anthony. No. Rounding second, heading for third is Alomar, and his dad Sandy will send him home, and the Padres now lead 4-1 on Tony Gwynn's triple. Tony hit one of the same spot with the same result last night against Jim Clancy. He had a triple last night. It was a leadoff triple and never scored in the inning. But this time, Gwynn finds the alley. They play Tony the other way, so when he hits the ball to right center field, it's almost a guaranteed three. Alibar is going to score easily, and despite the fact Yelding and Dorn execute the relay perfectly, no chance to get Gwynn at third base. Now, finally, there'll be a little bit of activity in that Houston bullpen. Here's Joe Carter. Been on base once, intentionally passed in the third. Fly it out to left field in the second inning. 
It's a 4-1 ball game. Padres now lead. And the pitch by Deshays is a breaking ball that misses low. Two balls and no strikes. Ramirez wants to come in and visit with Jim Deshays, and out comes Bob Cluck. Well, Cluck was actually coming out before the pitch and got about three steps out, and Deshays was already in his windup. So let's go to our studio and John Saunders with baseball tonight. Well, Stephen Day, we told you the Braves and the Dodgers. Pete Smith had a no hitter into the seventh, and here's why baseball's crazy. Cal Daniels, as hard as you can hit it, Jim Presley with a great play. The next batter is Eddie Murray. Just fights it off his fist, sends it out into left field. It drops in there for a base hit, and the no hitter is broken up in the seventh. The Dodgers up one nothing. Let's get back to Stephen Day. Well, we have a 3 1 ball game, 4 1 ball game now with San Diego leading. And Danny Darwin is warming up down in the Houston Astros bullpen. Well, Danny, who led all National League relievers with 122 innings pitch last year, is heating up. The Astros starting pitching has been abysmal this year. They've really been the problem for Houston. The relievers have done a good job. Last night was an exception. The relievers were touched up for eight runs in the eighth inning. Joe Carter has the count to him three balls and no strikes and they really want no part of Carter is second in the National League and RBIs with 43 Andre Dawson started tonight with 44 and number 44 is standing on third base with Tony Gwynn and there is ball four to Joe Carter so with nobody out up steps Jack Clark four walks now from Jim Deshaies Clark apparently coming on saying hey don't give him anything good to hit. If he wants to swing at a bad pitch, fine. Billy Doran comes in, possibly to visit and who will cover at second base. Now the Shays could be staring down the barrel as last man, depending on his result with Jack Clark. The Shays in a mild mess here. Third and first, nobody out. Really no place to put Clark in this situation. Bounces it in the dirt. Trouble right now for Jim Deshays. Runners in the corners and nobody out. And a run already in the in, in the inning with San Diego now leading 4-1. Well, good play by Biggio. He doesn't try to glove it one-handed like some catchers would. He just throws his body in front of it, lets it play off his chest protector, and then pounces it. No strikes. Well, Darwin's warming in a hurry. He needs to. Now the Ripper is going to look for one pitch here. He's got two balls, no strikes. He's going to look gas in and see if he can do something with it. Pops it up for the foul. Two balls and one strike. And he was telling us before the ball game. He said, "Hey, let's take a look at the, uh, at Cincinnati score." The Giants have jumped in front one nothing in the top of the seventh or there because San Diego came into this ball game just nine back trying to crawl back in the race here in early June. And Clark says yes he's one of those guys who does go for home runs in certain situations. He said just two on and we're down by three runs. Hey I'm going for it. He may be trying to put this game out of reach. I'll protect the plate more he said with two strikes. He has the count two and one right here. Carter's not going and Clark reaches out, drives it in the alley. Long run Wilson. It is in the alley. In comes Gwynn. In comes Joe Carter. And the throw will not be to the plate. They just bring it in and a two RBI double by Jack the Ripper. San Diego now leads six to one. Clark going the other way with it up the alley in right center and again Deshaies is throwing the ball well above the belt and you can't do that especially when you're throwing about 86. Clark will give way to a pinch runner. Phil Stevenson will come in to run and they'll take Clark out with a five run lead and uh, put the defensive man in and give Clark a chance to rest the back and that'll be all for Jim Deshaies. I really think that uh, Howe might have gone one hitter too long with Deshaies. I don't know if it was because Darwin wasn't loose but he came out and once uh, once Cluck went back to the dugout, Carter got the walk, and he really could have come out and made the change, but he didn't. 
Well, it's a 6 1 ball game. San Diego has the lead on Houston. We'll come back and tell you about Danny Darwin after this. The new pitcher is Danny Darwin. And he takes over for Jim Deshays, who got rocked around, particularly in innings number three and five. As a matter of fact, he gave up all six runs in those two innings three in the third, three more in the fifth. And Darwin takes over with a one and one record, a 2.67 earned run average. And this is his 23rd game this year. And Dave Campbell earlier was talking about his rubber arm, how he led the National League in innings pitched last year for relief pitchers. Well, he's doing it again this year. But Houston has a good bullpen, but they'd be better served if they didn't have to get into it quite so often and quite so early as they have this year. They only have one complete game, and that's by Mike Scott in a blowout. But uh, the Houston starters have really been a major disappointment. That's been the major problem with the team so far this year. Their starters' inability to get into the seventh and eighth innings with any kind of consistency. And throughout the 1980s, they were always known for their strong starting pitching. That Houston starting rotation used to be Nolan Ryan, and Joe Necro, J.R. Richard, Don Sutton, and Bob Nepper. Uh, with Mike Scott ailing, something's wrong with that right arm. He had 20 wins a season ago, and he has been just smashed around this year. And Santiago pops it back. No balls, two strikes to Benito. Well, I think maybe they noticed something on Scott a couple of starts ago. They were looking at some film of 1989 when Scott was going well. And he had a pulled hamstring last year. And Bob Cluck and, and Scott were looking at film, and they found out that Mike wasn't taking as long a stride, perhaps favoring the hamstring, developing some bad habits when he had the problem. They've lengthened out the stride again, and Scott is starting to pitch a little better, but he's still got some ways to go. In there to Benito Santiago, and he strikes him out. So Santiago is erased, and there is your first out of this fifth inning of play. Well, Darwin's efficiency at retiring the first batter this year has been phenomenal. That's 21 out of 23 first batters, and that's why I thought maybe they should have come and gotten Deshays with Jack Clark at the plate, leaving Deshays in, who was up constantly with the ball the entire game but that's hindsight and it may be that Darwin in all fairness to Art Howe was not loose. Well here's Sean Abner. Over two in this game grounded out in the second flied out to the center fielder in inning number three and you know talk about Mike Scott Roger Craig whose team bombed him on Sunday Mike Scott. Well he said he was the guy who caught him the split finger fastball and he said watching him it looks like he's short arming the ball a little bit more and not being able to, to losing a foot off that fastball. And he said that fastball has to set up the split finger. Swing and a miss by Abner. One ball, one strike. Well, part of the giant problem with all the injuries they've had to their pitching staff is they just really don't have anybody who's getting the ball up to the plate at 90 miles an hour. It could be that Scott Gareltz has found something tonight. Gareltz, who has came in with a one and six record and six plus ERA, is shutting out the Reds through six and a half innings tonight. Trying to beat Jack Armstrong, who came in with a record of eight and one. And Roger is so delightful. One of the really terrific managers in all of baseball, but their pitching staff has been decimated by injuries. And he had that funny comment early last week. He says, Well, I, I, I'm told I'm the, the guru of pitchers. Well, uh, the guru ain't worth a darn this year. Two balls, two strikes to Sean Abner. Well, Danny Darwin had one distinction in the 1980s. He and Nolan Ryan were the only pitchers in baseball to win at least eight games every year. So we certainly know a lot about Ryan. A lot of people don't know a lot about Danny Darwin, but he's been a quality pitcher for a long time. And those two are best of friends, both from Texas, tall, lean guys, like to throw hard, like to really challenge you. Balls, two strikes. Runner going. There's the pitch. Hit in the air. Left field and deep. Look out here. It is gone. And San Diego has an 8 1 lead. Tribulations of managing a major league team when things are going bad, they go bad. Astros had two games up in San Francisco over the weekend. They had commanding leads late and let them get away. 
Last night's ball game was a 2 1 affair before the Padres scored eight in the eighth. And San Diego has really had their hitting shoes on the last 12 ball games. They've scored in double figures four different times and are shooting to make this one the fifth. Gary Templeton takes strike one. Abner, that's his first home run of the year. His first one since July 5th of last year. And it came on a breaking ball that did not break. No, that would have been out of any ballpark, <laughs> especially this one. Even before 1982, it would have been out of here. Before they uh, brought in the fences. And there is Templeton with a drive to right field. And it is 9 to 1 San Diego. PR director Mike Swanson to tell us the last time the Padres had back to back homers but Gary Templeton has been hot and Santiago has been hot and Alomar and Gwynn have been hot and Biff Roberts Padres got a lot of guys hot at one time and right now the pitching of the opposition is going to do a little better at keeping the ball down or Padres are going to stay hot. Templeton now with four home runs of the year and twenty five RBIs Had a lot for a number eight hitter in the lineup there's a ground ball that Davis will handle himself. And finally, we have the second out of this inning. And coming to the plate now, the ninth man to hit. They had sent nine men to the plate in the third. They scored three that time. They've scored six thus far. That's Mike Swanson. You have probably heard that. Xavier Hernandez. We just thought we'd let you listen to Mike Swanson tell you about the last time back to back of Sid Fernandez last August. Finally, the inning is over. Nine to the plate, six runs across, and Art Howard's in trouble. His Astros are down nine to one in danger of losing their fifth straight. It has been the story of the big inning for the San Diego Padres in this three game series with the Houston Astros. They lead it 9 1. They had a 2 1 lead last night and scored 8 in the eighth inning to finally take home a 10 to 2 triumph. They've obviously been reading, reading Genesis of late. As we look at Phil Stevenson at first base. Takes over for Jack Clark. Well, come on, you know, Genesis. Oh, oh yeah, I'm really in, up in, on this. In the beginning, right? Uh, no. Isn't that how the Bible starts? <laughs> <laughs> In the beginning, you are the worst. <laughs> but thank you very kindly. Ken Caminiti, long fly to center field. Joe Carter makes the next attack. Well, it's 12:30 on the East Coast. I just want to make sure people are awake. That they can <laughs> boo into their television sets. Well, we were hoping we could uh, see Larry Anderson tonight, so we could lay a little, lay a little more poetry on you. Can't tell in Larry Anderson's stories. I don't think he's going to get in this one. I think Xavier Hernandez is going to be coming in to do a little mop up work in this one. 9 1 Padres lead. They scored three in the third. They scored six more in inning number five. We ought to just give you one Larry Anderson story, though, right? Okay. I mean, he's the master of asking questions that sometimes perplex you for an answer. As how can you tell when you're writing if you run out of invisible ink? <laughs> Larry. Ground ball foul. See, that's what happens when you sit down in that bullpen night after night after night and you got nothing to do till the fifth or sixth inning. You can perplex and ponder about some of these questions of life. I mean, Larry has said, why do they put expiration dates on sour cream? And roses are red and violets are blue. blue. I am a schizophrenic, schizophrenic and, and so am I. I. <laughs> Little acapella for you tonight. Yeah, Larry, at uh, 37 years old, the oldest relief pitcher in the National League, and so he's had a lot of time to sit and ponder these things. In life. He calls the relief staff 30 something. Yeah. Too bad they don't play for the Phillies. They could be the Wheeze kids. I mean, Anderson 37, Augusta's 34, Danny Darwin's 34. 
They got some Dave little, Smith is 35. Yeah, they got some age down in the bullpen. But they've done a good job. It's been the strength of their pitching staff up until this road trip, and they've had some problems. Up high. One ball, two strikes. Glenn Wilson will lead things off, then Eric Anthony to follow, and Rafael Ramirez. And I'll tell you, Rasmussen started this game in just horrible fashion. Walked the bases loaded in the first inning, had two errors in the first inning, one on him and one on Roberto Alomar. But since that time, he's pitched pretty well. And Templeton takes care of Glenn Wilson here, two down. Well, they got out of a bases loaded one out situation in the first, allowing one run, and a bases loaded two out situation in the third. And then when the mates came in and got three in the bottom of the third and six in the fifth, fifth Eric Anthony. Rasmussen is on cruise control right now. And we look at Casey Candell, he's getting the gloves off, probably going to get it at bat sometime tonight. Here's Eric Anthony. Base it to right field in the second inning, popped up to a second baseman, Alomar, in the fourth. Young man with plenty of power. Rick Mundy was saying last night as a San Diego broadcaster, his check swing is harder than my swing. Yeah, Rick selling himself short. Had some pretty good power years with the Dodgers and Cubs. Mm -hmm. Two balls, no strikes. He hammers one deep to center field here. Long run for Joe Carter and goodbye. It is five home runs for Eric Anthony this year and nine RBIs and it's a 9-2 ball game. Anthony had the luxury of sitting on a pitch 2 and 0. Oh. He got it where he wanted, right in his wheelhouse. Same thing the Astros did last Bobby night, too little, too late. Glenn Davis hit a ninth inning homer last night, but they were down 10 1 at the time. Young man has some power, though. He's going to be a force to reckon with in this league. That takes us to Rafael Ramirez. Here's the pitch. Gas. Belt high over the plate. Dream pitch. And Anthony did not miss it. Joe Carter is going to do a little uh, practicing the long jump, but Joe, not tonight. <laughs> that was a good 20 feet over his head. He just was practicing to see how that fence would hold his cleats in case he really has a chance at one. There's that curveball on the outside corner, one and two. Reaches out, dumps one into right field, base hit. Quinn sets up well, and Rafael says, Heck, I'm going to hold on with a single. Yeah, Rafael. <laughs> Seven <laughs> runs down, two outs. Don't take a chance. Casey Candell is going to be the pinch hitter. We saw Casey kind of loosening, and we're going to see Xavier Hernandez to come out and pitch the bottom of the six. Candell. About the only right handed bat with any authority coming off the bench. He had a pinch hit homer earlier in the year. Excellent utility man can play center field all outfield positions all infield positions. Haven't seen him at first base or catch yet. Only five seven 160 pounds from Lampock California. He's in his third major league season. Formerly with the Montreal Expos He's acquired in that Mark Bailey trade is now with the San Francisco Giants. Well, there are 65 sons of former major league players in organized baseball right now. But for Casey Candell, he's the only son of a former professional women woman baseball player. His mom, Helen St. Aubin, played professional baseball back in the 1940s. In the All-American Girls Baseball League. There's a gal here in San Diego when I used to work here. She'd be standing downstairs night after night handing me uh, clippings about that. I, I, I kind of doubted her at first. I didn't know they really had professional baseball for women, but they did. Back in the 40s and 50s, there were professional baseball leagues for women. Tough play, Temple, and Candell runs well, but they go to second base and get the force there. So Eric Anthony's solo home run makes it a 9-2 game. 
San Diego with three in the third, six more in the fifth, has a 9-2 to two lead and is on cruise control against the Houston Astros. And coming up on Wednesday night, it's the College World Series at Rosenblatt Stadium in Omaha, Nebraska. Should be a good one. Georgia Bulldogs going against the Stanford Cardinal. Stanford won today, a big victory over Mississippi State. Georgia just beat him the other day, and they're going against him again in that double elimination playoffs in San Francisco. The Giants right now with a 2-0 lead in the bottom of the seventh. Xavier Hernandez is the new Houston Astros pitcher. He's been damaged much of this year, but has outstanding stuff, and the Astros staff like him a lot. Texas High School Player of the Year way back in 1983. Went to the University of Southwest Louisiana, beat number one Texas one time, and Toronto's fourth round pick in 1986. Picked up by the Astros, and here trying to work and hold things down for San Diego as they have a seven run lead. Roberto Alomar takes a fastball that misses inside, two balls, no strikes. Alomar single back in the third. Broke a 1-1 tie. Ground ball. Doran takes care of it. One out. Franklin Stubbs, the new first baseman, replacing Glenn Davis. So uh, that change. Steve Fiziak and Dave Campbell at Jack Murphy Stadium in San Diego where the Padres enjoying a 10-2 lead. And right now, they're just eight games back because it looks like uh, San Francisco is beating Cincinnati and San Diego doing everything on Houston this year. Yeah, I look for the Padres very much to get back in this race. They're going to have to start keeping the ball in the ballpark. Their pitchers still have surrendered uh, 60 home runs now. Uh, that's really going to be a telling factor. Their pitching staff is better than that. The mid relief has to get better, and they got to get something out of that five hole. The one pitching tomorrow, Mike Dunn. But it figures that the Reds have to have one little tailspin. The Padres have had a couple already, and they're playing the best baseball in the division the last two weeks. Padres with two big innings in this game, the third and inning number five when they scored six runs. And the Astros will lead things off with Franklin Stubbs, who took over for first baseman Glenn Davis. They're announcing the attendance for tonight. It's 16,000 paid, but it'll be 17,000 total in the house. And there's a line drive to right field that Tony Gwynn takes care of. But I want to ask you, Dave, you live in this area. Have the fans been patient? Because at the beginning of this year, there were a lot of predictors who were saying San Diego would win the National League West. Well, I just looked at the attendance figures today, and they're drawing exactly what they did one year ago. They're averaging 26,000 fans uh, so far this year. They had a big night with Sports Bag Night on Saturday, drawing over 55,000. But, you know, this is a town that uh, proved in 1985 they will support their ball club. They, drew, they sold 2.6 million tickets, and they were really out of the race by August. I still think this franchise can draw three million if they can ever string a back to back year of division winning titles. Three million fans but nobody does that except the Dodgers. Well wait a minute now the Minnesota Twins did it in 87 yeah. the Cardinals do it the Mets do it this, this area is ripe. A couple of years ago Southern California the three franchises the Dodgers Angels and Padres drew eight point six million fans just in the 120 mile corridor. Of course there's a few people that live in this corridor. <laughs> too. <laughs> well you take a look at the talent that is in Major League Baseball. And California is the number one state, and you've got Texas and Florida, but I mean, my goodness, I'll bet 40% of the Major League rosters are dominated by Californians. Hard shot. Biff Roberts takes care of it. And takes care of Ken Caminiti. Two uh, outs. Uh, Biff has made three errors this year, and he made them all in one game. Otherwise, he's played a very solid third base or left field, no matter where you put him. They had a graph, I think, in USA Today showing since 1965, the first year of the free agent draft, when a guy you mentioned, Rick Mundy, was the number one player chosen in the nation. But 8,600 players plus have been drafted from California. The second state, Florida, 2,000, about 800. So, I mean, obviously, California in the lead by a, a huge margin. Then Here's was, Glenn Wilson. Then there was Alaska. <laughs> Three players drafted from Alaska in the last 25 years. I wonder how much the National Baseball Congress helped them because there was teams from Anchorage would be playing down in Wichita, Kansas. Yeah. Well, if they counted the guys that played in the Alaskan Summer League yeah. that uh, have gone on to play pro baseball, the number would be increased. But they're talking about natives of that state. <laughs> I mean, when. When you hit the ball on the ice, it goes wherever. <laughs> <laughs> All right, it's 10 to 2. Padres have the lead on the Astros here at Jack Murphy Stadium. It has been all 
San Diego. Two big innings in number three and number five. Deshaies got the start and was bombed. Seven earned runs in just four innings. Rasmussen has been solid. Anthony with a solo home run, but Abner and Templeton with back to bat shots in the fifth. And here's Roberto Alomar, and he almost takes off the head of the pitcher, Xavier Hernandez, as he spanks one back of the middle for his second hit of the night and pushes his average up over 330 again. Well, it's going to take some good pitching to cool off these Padre bats. Mark Portugal, we saw last Friday night, and he pitched tremendous baseball for six innings, and he goes for the Astros tomorrow night. But right now, you get the ball in the middle of the plate, and unless you got the extra gas on it, the Padre is going to address some fielders out there. They are really swinging the bats well right now. Well, here's Mr. Gwynn. Three for four in this game. His average right now at 342. He started the night at 333. I mean, that bat in his hand is almost like a paintbrush. And uh, the field is like a canvas. And he just kind of swishes it out there and paints the colors and paints the, the field. He is just wonderful to watch. Two balls, no strikes. We wouldn't call him the Andy Warhol of baseball. No, no. Rembrandt. We're perhaps. talking, yeah. There you go. Okay. A true artiste. I, I probably irritated a lot of Andy Warhol fans. I think he's a fine artist, but yeah. fine is not brilliance. And Boy. Tony Gwynn, when you're talking about hitting, he's number one. Of course, you could be at the Reichs Museum in Amsterdam right now and be seeing the <laughs> Vincent Van Gogh <laughs> exhibition as they're celebrating his 100th anniversary. How much is this painting going for? Ooh, what the 83 million uh, <laughs> last <laughs> one on the block. So Gwynn draws the walk. And that takes us to the disclaimer and David, because it's your hometown, I want you to read it. This copyrighted telecast is presented by authority of Major League Baseball and may not be reproduced or retransmitted in any form whatsoever without the express written consent of Major League Baseball or a direct letter to Faye Vincent. No, that's, I just added that. That's not true. That's only because Faye is in our audience tonight. Bob Cluck comes out to talk with Xavier Hernandez as he has put the first two runners on here in the eighth inning Roberto Alomar single Tony Gwynn has walked and Gwynn has been on base four times in this game. I wonder if Faye is here or if he uh, got Dodger disease and left by the seventh inning. <laughs> <laughs> Chavez they leave by the seventh inning to beat the traffic home. Well you got to congratulate that guy the way he handled the lockout getting that solved in as quick a time as he did because it looked like it was really going to stretch it out. Well here's Joe Carter. He has a lot of Bart Giamatta. Great enthusiasm, great love for the game, and a great feeling for the fans as well. Well, I think he showed that in, uh, in the situation during the earthquake during last year's World Series. Carter smashes one to center, yielding misplays he came in on, and then had to go back out. And there's one out. Going to third base was Roberto Alomar. Padres have two of the more intelligent base runners in the well, National League like and Roberto Alomar and Tony Gwynn. Not only are they fast but they are very very smart runners. See Carter getting pretty good extension on this one but the ball was down. That probably what kept it in the ballpark. Yelding took a step in but had time to retreat. And out comes Art Howe so evidently he wants to get somebody some work. Juan Agosto and how is going to make a pitching change. He was the guy who was damaged in San Francisco on Friday right here on ESPN. So Art Howe wants to go with Agosto. And with one out and runners in the corners. Art Howe talking with young Xavier Hernandez with San Diego leading 10 to 2 here at Jack Murphy Stadium. Padres trying to make it nine of their last 12 and you saw Art Howe he says let's go with Mr. Agosto. And we will. With the Padres holding on to an eight run lead here in San Diego. Three in the third, six more in the fifth, and one in the seventh for a 10 2 lead. ESPN Baseball Tonight, brought to you by Mitsubishi, bringing you a full line of award winning automobiles. See them all at your Mitsubishi Motors dealer. By Denny's Restaurants, where you'll find the famous Grand Slam breakfasts. Come in and try them soon. By Norelco Lift and Cut Shavers, we make close comfortable. And by Michelob Dry Beer. Once you experience the bold taste with no aftertaste, there's no going back. Steve Fiziak and Dave Campbell at Jack Murphy Stadium in San Diego where the Padres hold a 10 2 lead on the Houston Astros. The new pitcher is Juan Agosto. He got killed last night by 
the San Diego Padres only pitched an in uh, just a third of an inning allowed four hits and five runs. And uh, he came in with a 2 1. San Diego lead and when he was leaving I mean they were just eight runs in the eighth inning of play Agosto has not had it in the last week. I mean his earned run average has to be up near 40 in the last week. Big swing and a miss by Phil Stevenson. The count goes two balls and one strike. Stevenson out of Guthrie, Oklahoma. Drafted by the Oakland A's back in 1982 into the Chicago Cubs and acquired in the Darren Jackson, Calvin Chirali for Luis Salazar and Marvell Wintray with the Cubs. Inside misses, three balls and one strike, and Agosto a pitch away from loading the bases. Meantime, in San Francisco, the Giants are a 6 1 leader on the Cincinnati Reds in the ninth inning. Three balls and two strikes. And the Giants have just won it. San Francisco has just beaten Cincinnati. A final score of six to one. So if the Padres win tonight, they will be within eight games of first place Cincinnati. That is also the first time the Reds have lost a series this year. Stevenson, ground ball, Bill Doran. They'll try and get the double play. No, and the run scores. It's 11 to 2 Padres. When it goes like that, it goes like that. It was a Paul Harvey once said, it always helps to remember in times like this, there have always been times like this. <laughs> Rafael Ramirez double clutches. You see him shaking his head. This is just a dead double play ball. Good play by Dorn. Good feed to Rafi. And oops, can't get it out. Double clutch, lose the play, run scores. They had a critical moment last night's ball game that involved Gary Templeton where Eric Yielding went in hard at second base trying to break up a double play and it looked like there was no double play at all because the ball was not that well hit and it could have tied the score. But Yielding went into second base and grabbed Gary Templeton's ankle. They said it was interference automatic double play out of the inning and San Diego went out of the inning leading 2 1 they went on to score eight. In the bottom of the eighth, uh, claim a 10 to 2 win. Santiago has had a nice night. He's been on base all three three of his four times tonight. Base hit, pair of walks, and an RBI. A little surprised Mark Current didn't come on when uh, the Padres got that commanding 9 to 1 lead. Now 10 to 1 or 10 to 2 and 11 to 2. Current, the backup catcher, figures Santiago to play tomorrow night. Ken Caminiti finally cuts down San Diego but they score another run here in the eighth and they have a nine run lead of the Astros 11 to two we head to the ninth inning of play. San Diego with a pair of big innings early and then just adding on here in the late innings has an 11 2 lead over the Houston Astros trying to send the Astros to their fifth straight loss and coming up immediately following this ball game we've got Sports Center with Dan Patrick and Ann Montgomery taking a look at the Detroit Pistons big victory over the Portland Trailblazers and all the scores and highlights from around Major League Baseball. Saw Art Howe looking over his lineup card. I don't think it was so much from a strategic standpoint to decide who he's going to use as a pinch hitter this inning. I think more so he might have been figuring who needs an at bat the most. He in this situation you want to get somebody on the bench maybe who hadn't had an at bat lately so a little bit of uh, time where you might need him later in a clutch game. Well Dennis Rasmussen looking for a complete game tonight. He faces Eric Anthony who's two for three in the ball game singled in the second a booming home run to center field and inning number six. It was his fifth of the year and he has that kind of power. We're talking dramatic power. Came up from double A last year. Boy, he was just was scalding the baseball and he hits it high in the air. Joey Cora calls off third baseman Biff Roberts. And there's one out in the top of the ninth. But Anthony, they feel is the future and maybe the guy that can give him a solid punch and a little bit of fear in back of Glenn Davis in the four spot. He had 28 home runs in Columbus last year. That takes us to Rafael Ramirez. Cincinnati has already lost tonight 6 1 to the San Francisco Giants. So, with San Diego probably pulling down a victory tonight, 
leading 11 to 2. You think that's going to happen? They will be just eight back. Of the National League West leading. Right. Nice play, Bip Roberts. Long throw, gets his man. Two outs. It'll take a long while to have the defensive highlight of the night, but that's a tremendous play by Bip Roberts and Phil Stevenson, an excellent fielding first baseman. Diggs went out of the dirt, and Roberts, good play going to his right. Bipper delivers it a little low, but Phil Stevenson with a good stretch and digs it out. Pretty play. Well, he popped to his feet quickly, didn't he? Yeah, uh, he's very quick. Of course, Bip's only 5'7". He's built low to the ground, and he doesn't, get, he doesn't have quite as far to get up as a guy like Caminetti. <laughs> what did Craig Nettle say when Bip was over at second base? <laughs> Looks like he's throwing it underhanded. <laughs> like Stravino is a pinch hitter. Trevino, who had been getting a lot of playing time, but had been slumping, so he rode the pine tonight, but gets in the bat here. Off speed pitch foul back. Trevino's played with every Western Division team in the National League except San Diego. He's been with the Reds, the Astros, the Dodgers, the Giants, and the Atlanta Braves. Two balls and one strikes. Alex Trevino. Dennis Rasmussen looking for his second complete game this year. Earned run average will go down. It started at 3.45. He fouls it off. It's two balls and two strikes. And looking for win number six. Well, 18,000 were here, 16,000 paid. We're down to probably about 2,000 right now, but they're trying to get things going for this last strike. Breaking ball stays high. Rasmussen has continued to work the outside corner. He hasn't come in that often unless it was the breaking pitch that's almost out of the strike zone. Here's a 3 2 pitch to Trevino. And he sends a fly ball to Tony Gwynn and Wright. This should do it. San Diego has it. And ever since the meeting with Tony Gwynn and the rest of the team, they are now 9 and 12. Dennis Rasmussen with his sixth victory of the year. Jim Deshays takes the loss. He's now 3 and 3. And the Padres are on a roll. They're with an 8 of Cincinnati, who lost tonight 6 1 at San Francisco. Well, tomorrow night, we've got the New York Yankees going against the Boston Red Sox. And David, a fine ball game from Dennis Rasmussen. Indeed, he pitched out of trouble in the first and third innings, and from that point on, it was smooth sailing once his offense got a lot of runs for him. Over. We've got Sports Center coming up next. Our final score 11 to 2, Padres leading the Astros.